Bible Moses Lake Christian Church. Greetings to you, and I hope that wherever this video finds you today, that you are doing well. My name is Phil Payne, and I'm one of the teaching pastors on staff at Moses Lake Christian Church. And, and I just want to say right off the bat that I, I, I love you and I miss you. I miss being together. Uh, wow, the, the life has changed so much for us in the last couple of weeks. Um, the church has left the building right? It's a, a phrase that we've been talking about, and, and it's not only a reality of our lives, but it's the focus of our sermon series. As Pastor John and I get an opportunity to share a little bit with you in a completely different format, a, a video format, we're, we're talking about and focused on the reality that the church has left the building. On a normal Sunday morning, you might be getting up and driving, uh, arriving at church at 200 Yanazawa and parking your car as I would be doing and walking in, being greeted at the door, you know, grabbing a cup of coffee out of the coffee bar and, and working your way into church. Uh, that There would be awesome music and worship happening. I would be sharing with you from the stage. Um, but but today, I'm, I'm coming to you on video. I'm coming to you in this format. And, and yet I hope that the goal and the accomplishment will be the same. I hope that as we spend a few minutes together this morning that you will be encouraged from God's Word, that you will see Him a little clearer, and that you will be asking God, God, what do you have for me in the midst of all of the challenges that we faced, uh, really, and, and the many changes that we've seen in the last two weeks. We're in some uncharted waters here, aren't we? Um, the corona pandemic has changed our lives. It's changed our families' lives. It's changed our kids' lives. Uh, our grandkids, they're, they're maybe going to school in a different place. Our, our jobs, our hobbies, even the way we socialize has changed. It's still okay to socialize. You just have to do it from a distance, right? Even that whole word of social distancing is something that we've brought into our lives and our vocabulary. And, and, and this pandemic, this challenge with the coronavirus, it's impacting all of our lives. You know, the question that I want to just think about for a few minutes this morning as we take a look at God's Word is, and the question I've been pondering, I've been asking myself, and, and we've been asking as a staff, and we're asking of our church community is, how has this coronavirus pandemic changed our walks with God? How has this coronavirus pandemic changed our walks with God? Now, make sure you heard me correctly. I'm not asking how has the coronavirus changed God. The reality is God has not changed. God's desire in the midst of all of these challenges is still to be real and, and available to you. His desire is the same. He hasn't changed. This pandemic has not caused a major concern in heaven. They're not walking around heaven saying we've got to put out a daily press conference or, or where did this corona thing come from? No, it hasn't taken God by surprise. God is eternal, He is immortal, He is all-knowing, and nothing takes Him by surprise, including this current crisis here on earth. God is in control. Even when we feel like things are out of control, God has not changed. But the question I've been pondering is this, how have these challenging times changed the way we walk out our faith in God? Our personal walk with God, our public walk with God pretty easy before this whole pandemic to define our Christianity by the fact that we were in church, or maybe we got together with our life group this last week. But what happens when those things are, are taken away? What does that mean for our faith and our walk with Jesus? What does our walk with Christ look like in, during these days when the normally organized part of Christianity is no longer an option, when we can't meet together? at 200 Yanazawa, when we can't move about as freely as we once did. How have these challenging times impacted our walk with God, our faith in God, both personally and publicly? You know, as I, I pondered that question, the first thing that came to my mind is suddenly we, we potentially have more time on our hands, don't we? Personally, we have more time. As married couples, potentially, we have more time. We have more time with our children, we have more time with our grandchildren. You know, we're normally so busy. Just a few short weeks ago, we talked about this in church, didn't we? That the pace of our lives, our calendars that are so full, they live, leave really little space for God sometimes. We pack our days and we fill our schedules and we run at such a pace that the busyness of our life is robbing us of the opportunities we have to walk deeper with God. 
But now in the midst of this is sheltering at home, in the midst of maybe work looking different for you, school looking different for you, being at home for a longer period of time. I know in my own life, travel has ceased. My, my calendar has freed up. And suddenly I have more time. I still have responsibilities, but I have more time than I normally do here in my house. And so as we think about that question, I wonder about how, how, how do we take advantage of that? And, and I know there's some challenges. I know we're trying to figure out how to work at home. I know we're trying to figure out how to educate our kids at home. But for many of us in this current reality, we do have more time than usual. And so the question for you, the question for me maybe is, how has having more time than normal impacted my walk with God? As I pondered this, I, I went to my Bible, and I would invite you to do the same. I'd invite you to, to grab your Bible and, and, and open it up this morning to Ephesians chapter 5. That, that's where I want to spend just a couple of minutes thinking about that question. How have these challenging times changed the way we walk with God and walking out our faith personally and publicly? Ephesians chapter 5, Paul wrote some really incredible words as he was writing to the Ephesians and he was talking about time. And I'm going to read to you Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 to 20, and I'm going to read it out of the message. Here's what it says in Ephesians 5, 11 to 20. Don't waste your time on useless work, mere busy work, the, the barren pursuits of darkness. Oppose these things, expose these things, excuse me, for the sham that they are. It's a scandal when people waste their lives on things they must do in the darkness where no one will see. Rip the cover off those frauds and see how attractive they look in the light of Christ. Wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffins. Christ will show you the light. And then in verse 15, he says this. So watch your step. Use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God. Huge droughts of him. Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing psalms from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything. Any excuse for a song to God the Father in the name of our Master, Jesus Christ. You know, Paul has a lot to say to us and to challenge us to think about maybe the, the time that we have on our hands right now. I love what he says in, in verse 15. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the Master wants. For some of you in the version that you're reading, it says understand what the Lord's will is. And so that's a great question to ask. And maybe some of us are asking that in the midst of, of this pandemic and the coronavirus and the challenges is, God, what are you doing? What are you up to? What, what is it that the master wants in the midst of these times? What is the Lord's will for me in the midst of these times? And, and yet God shares that with us really, really specifically in his word. God wants you and me to give him glory. He, he wants us to make his name great even in the midst of challenging times. He, he wants to be in deep relationship with us and for us to be in deep relationship with him. Maybe this season for you, maybe this season for me of forced slowing down is a time to cultivate some new habits in regards to our walk with God. New habits for us personally, maybe new habits for us in our family. You know, again, I shared this a couple of weeks ago. We talked about how difficult it is at the pace that we run to live vibrant lives with Christ. But potentially we've been given some more time. And so what would that look like with the more time that we've been given to spend some time intentionally reading God's Word? How are you doing reading God's Word? How are you doing opening up the Bible and spending time with Him? But what about our prayer lives? You know, prayer lives, oftentimes, it, it, we, we talk more about prayer than we actually pray. But now that we've been given some extra time, maybe we take that time and, and we invest it in prayer. What about silence and reflection and solitude? It's that extra time that we get to take 30 minutes to sit, just us and God, to take that time and, and to reflect on, how, how am I doing, God? How is my walk with God growing? Maybe it's a time of worship. That we find some of our favorite worship songs and just spend some time worshiping God. 
Maybe it's memorization. Grabbing a verse, maybe even these verses out of Ephesians 5 and saying, you know what, it's been a long time since I committed a verse to memory. And I'm going to spend some time memorizing God's word to hide it in my heart. You know, the, the question for us today is how are we intentionally investing the time that we've been given to deepen our walk with God, both personally and in our marriages with our children? Notice I asked the, the question, how, how are we intentionally investing our time? Because you and I know the truth that just because we're given more time doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to be intentional with that time. Oh, it's easy to look at this time and say, hey, I can grab more time on Netflix or, or I can grab some time on those home projects. And those are wonderful things. It's great to get some things done around the house. It's great to catch up on, on, on maybe a movie that you haven't seen. But it's also easy to waste our time, right? And so how do we intentionally invest this time? You know, with our kids that we have suddenly at home. And, and maybe you're facing some of the challenges of, of, of homeschooling at home or you've got kids at home. And in the midst of everything else you have to get done, how about taking some time with God's word and, and opening God's word with them? Maybe spending some time praying with your kids. You know, for years as a youth pastor working with, with families in the public school, I heard for a long time from parents, hey, I, it's such a shame that kids can't pray in school. And while that is true, and we could, we could talk about that, here's the reality now. We can pray with our kids at home. We can sit with our kids and, and pray with them and teach them to pray. You, you've suddenly been given a new opportunity with your kids and what school looks like. Maybe some worship, maybe some memorization. It's not just our kids, but what about with our spouses? You know, maybe we've got some more time with our husband, our wife, our, our spouse. How, how about spending some time reading scripture together? Spending some time praying together. Again, how are we intentionally investing our time that we've been given to deepen our walk with God, personally, in our marriage, with our children. How have these challenging times changed the way we walk with God, the use of our time? Maybe the time that we have is a gift. Maybe the time that we've been given is something that we could take advantage of and invest intentionally to cultivate some new habits, strengthen some of those habits we already have in our walk with God. That's the first thing I was thinking about. The second thing that I was thinking about is, is our attitudes. You know, how, how's, how's our attitude these days? How's my attitude? How's your attitude? I, I think when we face difficult, uncertain times, we always have a choice with how we approach it. We always have a choice with our attitudes. You know, it's been said that crisis builds character. I, I disagree with that. You know, crisis has a tendency to reveal our character, not necessarily build it. I love the quote from Dallas Eakins. He said this, I'm a big, big believer in circumstance, choice, and character. They go right in line. You're put in a circumstance, you make a choice, and that choice reveals your character. Okay, that's a great quote from Dallas Eakins. Circumstance, choice, and character. How's our attitude these days? How are we responding, reacting to the crisis that we see around us? You know, one of the things that, that I, I think we're seeing pretty common in, in our day today is an attitude of scarcity. We can approach these challenging times with an attitude of scarcity or an attitude of generosity. In the simplest terms, the scarcity mindset is a belief that there will never be enough, whether it's money or food or emotions or something else entirely. And as a result, my actions and my thoughts, they stem from a place of lack. Stephen Covey in, in, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said this, most people are deeply scripted in what I call a scarcity mentality. They see life as having only so much, as though there were only one pie out there. And if someone were to get a big piece of the pie, it would mean less for everyone else. That's a scarcity mentality. You know, we, we've all kind of laughed about the toilet paper situation going on right now, Right? And, and we look at this and, and, and we kind of, you know, on, on a normal day, we would look at toilet paper and say, yeah, no, no big deal. But today, this has become a precious commodity, hasn't it? You know, we, we, we look and we say, I, I don't really think it really makes a lot of sense. Why are people grabbing so much toilet paper? As much as we know, coronavirus does not cause diarrhea, right? This isn't something that's impacting our, our, our normal day-to-day -day bowel. So why? What's up with this? You know what? This is scarcity mentality. 
It's a fear that I'm going to run out. There will not be enough. And so as we see people, and, and maybe even some of us, we go to the store and, and when we would normally just buy a few things for ourselves, now we're stocking up, we're grabbing stuff. We're, we're, we're maybe even giving in to a scarcity mentality. Here's some challenges with the scarcity mentality. The, the scarcity mentality makes us myopic. It really does, that, that idea of nearsightedness. When I have a scarcity mentality, I focus on me. I only see the things right around me. Here's the other thing about a scarcity mentality. It leads to fear. What if I don't have enough? And that can feed on itself and we can look at life and circumstances and, 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 and begin to be really fearful. And I think one of the things happening today is, is fear is just being bred around us over and over and over again. And a scarcity mentality is going to increase that fear. And then the third thing about a scarcity mentality is it leads to selfishness and hoarding. Man, I look at my life and think that I've got to get it. I've got to make sure I have enough. How, how are we doing with that? Are, are we seeing that scarcity mentality creeping into our lives? Now, I want to say that it's understandable. It's understandable. I get it. I know that in times like this, we, we do look around and say, hey, I want to make sure I have enough for me and my family. I want to make sure that, that I, I've got the things that, that I, I, I need in my day-to-day -day life. It's understandable. But I also want to challenge us that this is one of the ways that we can grow in our walks with God during this uncertain time. I can recognize it. I can recognize the scarcity mentality. It's leading me to focus on me. It's leading me to focus on fear. And it's leading me to focus on selfishness. And I can bring that to God. I can confess it to God. I can talk to God about it. And I can say, God, I, I, this is in my life, but this is not how I want to live. And so, God, would you help me? Would you help me with my scarcity mentality? Because the other attitude that, that we also can choose is an attitude of generosity. This is an attitude that's not marked by fear or living fearfully or selfishly, but an attitude that, that reflects that we trust in God. And we even trust in God enough that he's going to meet our needs and we have enough and we could even share with others. You know, Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 6. We were just in Ephesians. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. I want to share one more passage with you. And Matthew 6 says this, starting in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to our life? And why do you worry about clothes? Look at the flowers of the field and how they grow. They don't labor. They don't spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, not, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble in his own. Man, there are some incredible things in here that Jesus has challenged us to think about. Not to live with a scarcity mentality, but a generous mentality. And so how do we do that? How do we shift from scarcity to generosity? Well, Jesus gives us a couple of really practical things in here. The first thing he challenges us to think about is that life is more than possessions, right? That's what he says in verse 25. Hey, hey, don't worry about your life while you eat or drink about your body. Is not life more than food and body more than clothes? It is. One of the first things we need to recognize is that our life is more than just our possessions. We know that intellectually, but now we're starting to think about it and realize, hey, life is more than that. The second thing Jesus challenges us to do is to look to nature. And he says, you know what? Look to nature and look at how I take care of nature. I, I, I see, he said, take a look at the birds of, of the air, the flowers of the field. You know, I love this time in Moses Lake, this time of year. 
uh, my wife Elizabeth and I were out on a walk today, and, and, and several times I saw robin's land. And in the in the, the spring, as as the winter starts to come out of the cold, and, and we start to see a little more sun, a little more warmth, we see the birds, and they're popping up, and they're building nests. And I want to challenge us, even in these days, to look at those birds, to see their beauty, to see their simplicity, and realize that they're not running around losing their mind, thinking, what if there's not enough? No, they don't live in a scarcity mentality because they know. And God says that God will take care of them. But it's not just the birds, it's also the flowers. You know, this time of year in our community, we look around and we see the iris bulbs starting to pop up. We see blossoms on the trees. And again, trees and plants are, are not stressing out, saying, how am I going to grow this year? How, what, what if there's not enough for me? No, God says he is taking care of the birds and the plants and the flowers. And how much more important are you to God than even those beautiful birds and those beautiful flowers? So we need to live a life and realizing it's more than, and our life is more than just possessions. We need to look to nature and see how God takes care of the birds and the flowers, and he will take care of us. The third thing Jesus says out of this passage is to live a life of faith, trusting in God even in the hard times, to remember that God sees you. He knows what you need. Boy, these are troubling times. Some of us are, are looking and saying, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to keep, am I going to be able to work? Am I going to be able to afford things in the future or the present? But God sees you. God says he will take care of you. I also want out of this passage just to challenge us that, to remember that we serve a generous God. God is a God of generosity. He gives life. He gives breath. He gave his only son, Jesus, who left heaven and came to earth to live and to die. Right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that you and I might have relationship with him and know him for eternity. We serve a generous God, and we're made in his image. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. He's given us the church. And if God is generous and we're made in his image, then we have part of that in us. We were wired. We were made to live generous lives. Jesus said that, right? If you're going to clutch onto your life and hold it, you're going to lose it. But if you learn to give away your life, you'll find it. We need to think about living generous lives because we serve a generous God. So in a real practical sense, I would also challenge you here. As we think about serving a generous God, I would challenge you to make a list of gratitude, a thanksgiving list. Maybe this is something you do personally. Maybe it's something you do as a couple. Maybe it's something you do as a family. But to sit down and make a list of all the reasons that you have to be thankful to, to sit down even in the midst of these difficult times and say, God, what are the things that I can be grateful for? I can be grateful for my house. I can be grateful for the friends around me. I can be grateful for the, the breath and life in my lungs. To think about the times in your life when God has provided in the past. And as we make that list of gratitude, that Thanksgiving list, here's what's going to happen. It's going to shift our perspective from scarcity to generosity. I love what Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says. It says, a generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Try it on. When we, we live with scarcity mentality, our lives are filled with fear and selfishness. And yet when we live as God does, and God challenges us, and, and Jesus in Matthew 6, to live with generous lives, we find refreshment and peace, and we find God's spirit in us and working through us. So life is challenging around us, isn't it? It's rapidly changing every day. It feels like something new is popping up. And those changes are challenging for sure. We're not going to uh, pretend like it's not difficult. For some, it's really difficult. But I also want to remind you today that in every crisis, there are opportunities. Opportunities to learn, to grow, to change. What is it that God is giving us, those opportunities in these times to learn, to grow, to change, to be more like Jesus? He's given us more time. And so how are we investing that time? How are we making the most of our time to grow deeper in love with him and deeper in love with the people around us? And then what about our attitudes? 
in this challenging time, the coronavirus pandemic, I have a choice every day that I can live in fear and selfish and a scarcity mentality, or I can ask God to be changing me to live as I'm convinced he wants us to live generous lives. Grateful for what we have, grateful to God and depending on him every day and then living generously in our community. Blessings on you, Moses Lake Christian Church. We love you. We're praying for you. You're not alone. We are in this together. Let's lift up God's name, make his name great in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in our communities, and as God gives us opportunity around the world. Love you, praying for you. Have a fantastic day.